Thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Um, so before I start with the science, uh, let me say uh, something on the occasion. So happy birthday, Mike. Um, Eliezer today in the morning said that uh, people are saying something on the occasion and then they start talking about themselves. Uh, so indeed, that was uh, what I was planning to do. Um, so I'm one of the uh, formerly young postdocs who got uh, much inspired by Mike. Um, I spent my first postdoc at Rutgers and already uh, Jaume Gomez uh, described how the place was at the time. Um, so in particular, there were great lunches, he said, and group meetings. And I fully agree to this and I can even top this, I think, by saying that there was a general very, very open atmosphere and in particular Mike was uh, sharing all his insights with um, all the postdocs and students and whoever was interested in it and that was really uh, great and influential for um, uh, for my career. Uh, in particular, we collaborated on D-brains, on Calabiao manifolds, in particular on the Quintic. And also after that, Mike was working on categories and uh, how uh, D-brains are described by categories. <coughs> and um, yeah, I was uh, really excited about it and happy that he shared um, all his insights. Okay. Um, I was trying to find photographs of the time. Uh, I did find some in old boxes, but uh, somehow if one looks at the photos of the time, they don't quite uh, reflect the memories that I have. So it looks somehow like we have been hiking all the time or <laughs> canoeing in the Pine Barrens and that people were standing on their hands with their head in the water, um, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so I sort of refrained from uh, bringing any photos, um, though the uh, occasion has brought many fond memories. OK, um, yeah, I'm still working on uh, things related uh, to D-brains on Calabiaus and also to categories. And today I'm going to speak about something category. Um, namely, I want to talk about uh, truncated affine rosansky witten models as extended topological quantum field theories. Um, so in particular, these are sort of twisted <coughs> versions of three-dimensional supersymmetric theories. And I will put them in a mathematical framework. Um, to some extent. And um, the plan of the talk is that I first explain a bit more on the coming slides um, what I have in mind and then I give a more detailed plan later. Okay, um, so how do uh, mathematicians think about uh, topological quantum field theories? Um, well, they think about it as a functor from some geometric category, which is a category of bordisms, to, for example, a category of vector spaces. And we physicists think about um, doing a path integral on some surface that I've sketched here. We evaluate that path integral and, for example, we can cut the surface and compute the path integral on on the individual pieces and glue it back together. And then um, the result is supposed to be independent of the way how we cut and put together the pieces. So that's what is um, formalized uh, by this uh, functorial definitions that mathematicians um, give. So they say, we look at the category of bordisms on the one side and the category of vector spaces on the other side and formulate a functor between them. So on this side, um, we have objects that are closed uh, D minus one manifolds if the QFT is in dimension D. So in this two dimensional picture, it would be dimension one and objects that are vector spaces that you can imagine by obtaining them by um, canonically quantizing on a piece, on a cylindrical piece over a D minus one manifold. Um, then there's a special object that is an empty set 
and special vector space that are the complex numbers. And there are, then there are maps between d minus one manifolds given by Bordisms and on the other side by linear maps. And you can compose the linear maps that corresponds to gluing on the geometric side. Um, yeah. The, the, the special object in particular has the property that um, if you take disjoint unions on this side or tensor products on that side, then the empty set or the complex numbers are the unit elements that, um, with which you can tensor for free without changing anything. Um, so let me draw a few pictures in two dimensions. So these are two dimensional pictures, but on this slide you can read in any dimension. So here's again part of what I said. So to a circle you, um, you associate a vector space and um, I will talk about oriented TQFTs. So there's an orientation, but I will be rather sketchy and not draw this much. So what at this point, let me say there's a dual thing to which I associate a dual vector space then to the union of circles, I associate the tensor product of vector spaces. There's an identity on the vector space. And then here's something that will show up later again as well. There are evaluations and co-evaluation maps that go from dual space tensor space to the complex numbers in, in this picture and the co-evaluation that goes the other way. And then these um, satisfy some important gluing properties, namely that I can glue these two guys together and obtain um, a cylinder. And here I spelled out a formula from linear algebra. So I start with the empty set tensor, the space here, and I use the co-evaluation on, on this uh, empty set or complex numbers on that side to get two vector spaces and then I um, I evaluate again and um, then this means that decompose I, that I can decompose the identity in this way using evaluation and co-evaluation and that's now important um, because it implies that the vector spaces must be finite dimensional otherwise this thing won't work um, and it's means it, it's a dualizable, du, dualizability condition on the vector spaces that we will encounter more. Here's the first simple example. Okay, so now this slide is really two-dimensional. Um, so in two dimensions, the functor is specified by giving it on the basic uh, building blocks of two-dimensional surfaces. So um, there is a multiplication and a co-multiplication and some units. And mathematicians then figured out that two-dimensional topological quantum field series uh, correspond to commutative Fro Frobenius algebras. So there are some gluing relations such as this one. So you can glue the two pairs of pens together like this or like that. And then that gives you an associativity condition and so on. So now that's very nice in two dimensions, um, but higher dimensions are more complicated and one doesn't have uh, maybe uh, such building blocks. And it's if you want to prove some powerful theorems, for example, or if you are inspired by physics, uh, you might come to the idea that you would like to look at a more elaborate structure. And that's what's happening in extended topological quantum field series or even fully extended topological quantum field series. Um, so in this context, one doesn't just associate something to the d-dimensional manifolds um, and the d minus one uh, manifolds, but to any two manifolds in any co-dimensions in the Bordism category. So this slide is on, um, on the uh, geometrical Vordism categories. So what, so you want to extend it and um, yeah, start with the point, for example. So here I'm indicating 
that there can be different uh, kinds of points with an orientation, then I'm going to drop this again, but just to mention this once. So objects of this category are points that can come with a plus or minus label. Okay, then we have the first uh, layer of morphisms. So if objects are points, then natural maps between them are given by lines between them. So for example, some identity line or again something um, evaluation type where you map a point uh, unified union with a point uh, to the empty set or co-evaluation where this goes the other way around. And again I can compose in this simple category by gluing together uh, these points. So, for example, I can form a closed circle, which I read as a map from the empty set to the empty set if I glue together these two things. Let's move up one dimension. Um, so, I now um, want to look at uh, two, two dimensional manifolds regarded as maps between the one manifolds. So just the same thing as on the previous slides, but one layer up. Um, in particular, I have picked uh, some examples here that uh, will be important later. So again, there's an evaluation map. Um, so what was an evaluation map? Well, it was a map from a thing um, together with its uh, dual thing to the identity. So a map from here, from this one dimensional picture to this one dimensional picture that is now um, geometrically realized by giving a two dimensional bordism. So um, now read this from bottom to top instead of left to right like here. So here I have again the two um, things that were the evaluations in one dimensions, and then I have a two-dimensional surface that mediates this map. So this is the evaluation on the evaluation because it's the evaluation on the evaluation, also the two-dimensional evaluation on the one-dimensional evaluation. And then I have similar things. So for example, um, the co-evaluation was from uh, this times this to the identity on the empty set. So this is this empty set and I can visualize this as um, such a cap. And um, now basically you can see that we can regard any two-dimensional surface, we can decompose any two-dimensional surface into such simple pieces that we get by formulating the adjunctions on the adjunctions. So this duality data on the duality data of the previous layer. So here I've drawn some picture and then you also have the opposite ones. So this cup and um, the inverted uh, saddle, so to speak. And then we have pieces like this. So this is just the identity, so this cylindrical um, extension of the co-evaluation that we had in one dimensions. Okay, um, so these geometrical considerations ask for, uh, so we still want to formulate the topological quantum field theory in terms of a functor, and um, so let's uh, look for suitable targets. So um, what targets do we have in particular inspired by physics uh, that we could use as uh, targets for our higher uh, categorical Buddhism uh, category? And uh, so the target categories could, for example, be um, defect topological quantum field series. So in defect quant topological quantum field theories, we also have uh, several layers of morphisms. So they seem to be nice candidates as uh, target categories. So I drew this in the picture for a three-dimensional defect TQFT. 
So in this picture, I have two three-dimensional topological quantum field theories. They can a priori be different or also the same. Um, in between them is a co-dimension one defect. So in this case, it's a surface defect and so on. So on the surface defect, I can have line defects and on the line defects, I can have um, yeah, further defects. So in this case, in the three-dimensional case, I'm uh, at the end. So this is dimension zero representing a local operator. Um, then there is in defect TQFTs an idea of what it means to compose stuff. So we can merge defects in any dimensions um, with a nice uh, compatibility properties. So here I'm colliding two surface defects to get a new surface defects between this initial theory and the theory on the right hand side, squeezing in any degrees of freedom that live in between and making them surface degrees of freedom in this picture. And then the same for the other dimensions. So here are two line defects living on a surface defect. Um, degrees of, so surface degrees of freedom can live anywhere here. And if I collide these two green lines, I get a single line. Um, and then for two local operators, I can take the OPE. Um, so, oops. This is a nice structure. And um, so let me say now what I want to talk about in a bit more detail. Um, I want to regard a very simple theory. So I'm sorry, from the physicist point of view, this is really a trivial example. Um, nonetheless, I think it's sort of interesting and promising um, to look at a theory of uh, free hypers, so, so 3dn equals 4 from the per perspective of extended uh, TQFTs. So what is it physically? Well, a free theory of four scalars plus a bunch of fermions. And then I twist this. Uh, so in three dimensions, the R symmetry is SU2 <laughs> times SU2. I pick one of them, namely the ones that leaves the scalars alone so that they are still scalars in the twisted theory. But then it does something with the fermions and the multiplets. It in particular produces a bunch of vectors um, under the new Lorentz or new uh, Euclidean symmetry. Um, okay, so then one has expectations for the state spaces uh, just from physics. So, um, yeah, there are four scalars and they uh, can be regarded as in a, in a comp, so all of this is hyperkähler and so on, but uh, we, in picking a complex structure, we can regard or we expect to have a topological ring, which is the, just the, um, the polynomials and two variables or in two n variables for n hypers. And then if I have, if I associate uh, state spaces to higher genus surfaces, I expect in addition a contribution from the fermions that um, turned into vectors under the twist. Then one also expects some grading. So physically, we have an R symmetry and a flavor symmetry with potentially. And mathematically, these will show up as gradings of these vector spaces. OK, um, so now um, let me mention that these state spaces are in particular infinite dimensional. Um, so we cannot expect to describe this model as an ordinary three-dimensional topological quantum field theory because the state space is infinite dimensional and therefore this won't do. This has to do with the non-compactness of the target. Um, but we can still describe the model as a two-dimensional uh, topological quantum field theory, but now with values not in vect, but in some other category motivated by defects. And um, basically, we can compute everything by taking the point of view of the uh, cobordism hypothesis and formulating everything on. So what does it mean? That means that we start with a point and then 
say what happens on these adjunction maps that I described before. And in this, ex this example is sort of simple enough that I can say what all these adjunctions are. And in that way, start from the point and uh, move up to the two-dimensional surface and compute, for example, these state spaces in the end. OK, I think it has to do with if one moves backwards this noise. So let me. Uh, OK, so what I have to do is to tell you um, what my target category is. Um, so it's a category of defects. And um, this category of defects uh, has been described in papers by Kapustin, Rosansky, and Saulina, and in particular, a paper by Kapustin and Rosansky. And I can take the category from those papers. Um, so my theories are, uh, so physically, I want to describe three hypers. And um, that means that the objects of the categories are supposed to be the free hypers, so they are formulated as uh, lists of variables um, that I uh, denote by underlining these accents, and it's supposed to mean n variables for n hypers. Mm. Then there are one morphisms. Um, so and the variables are complex numbers or pairs of complex numbers? You mean uh, the axis? Well, in some sense, uh, this is sort of the model T star CN or something, and this is the CN. And for example, oh, oh. yeah. Okay, yes. Um, okay, then I have one morphisms um, preserving 2, comma 2 uh, supersymmetry physically in this uh, in the model and. Um, well, they describe it in terms of some holomorphic functions in variables uh, from, this, from the bulk and additional variables that, that live on this defect or are assigned to this defect. And then uh, there is this holomorphic superpotential style function that is just a polynomial in all of these variables. And then there's, uh, one can collide with such defects uh, and there is, in particular, there's a monoidal structure or a, a notion of this uh, collision of co-dimension one defects where you sort of, um, yeah, so you collide these two things that squeezes in these y variables. And so on the result, we have the a variables from this defect, the b variables that live on that defect, and the y variables that become defect variables, and we add the superpotentials. Um, then we have to say what the line operators are. Um, so let me be very brief about it. Um, so basically you have some landau ginzburg style model living on this uh, two-dimensional defect. And then it's um, sort of known what the line defects and the point, de point defects should be. So they are matrix factorizations of the difference of the superpotentials. So I have superpotential here in A variables and here in A prime variables. And then one can formulate a matrix factorization of this difference. Or in, in other words, um, one can associate to this some twisted two periodic uh, complex where this twisting means that in this complex the, the differential squares to the difference of the superpotentials. There's also a notion of composition which is just to take tensor product. And then the point defects would be the morphisms of, of these things. So altogether one gets a three category. Um, this has, there are some very important um, invisible defects. So physically, they just do nothing. And mathematically, uh, or from the structure, or yeah, it's also physically. So what does it mean? It means that we have to formulate one morphisms and give them by, uh, in the form that I um, 
displayed on the previous slide. So some bunch of variables living on this defect and the super potential. So specify this and then check that the collision of this thing with any other thing is just isomorphic to this other thing. Um, so the, the thing that does the job, and that's what they already stated in, in their paper, so in this kapustin rosansky paper, the thing that does the job is this superpotential. So A times X minus Y, or spelled out in N components, this sum over uh, components is uh, the superpotential of the identity, invisible identity defect. And then if you take this product, um, so a priori you get uh, something with surface variables a, b, and y, and this potential, and then that's isomorphic to this object. Um, and to see this, there's some, something called Knorr periodicity on the category of matrix factorizations, or in other words, you can uh, find an invertible matrix factorization that relates this to that. So you can make this isomorphism explicit. And then same thing, one layer down. Um, we also have an identity line that, for example, uh, lives on the identity defect, but also on any other uh, defect, we can formulate an invisible line. So that has to be a matrix factorization of the difference of these two potentials that come from this identity defect. Um, so I think um, this is indeed invisible um, <laughs> on the slides. Uh, so yeah, so the super in invisible line defect. Yes, so I can see it on the projector. Um, I choose very weak colors for the invisible defect. So yellow for the surface and light gray for the line defect that now you cannot see. Um, so this doesn't matter because it's indeed uh, invisible. <laughs> um, so there's a concrete uh, matrix factorization that does the job and then makes uh, these pictures indeed be the same. So on this picture, uh, the light gray line is uh, indeed not supposed to be there. Um, so there's a matrix factorization that is basically A minus A prime times other stuff. And this A minus A prime makes A and A prime be identified and glued together um, so that A prime can vanish in this picture. Um, OK. So now, um, what is my target category? Um, so uh, kapustin rosansky gives a three category, and um, I want to truncate it one layer down. So my, the, the objects that I want to look at are lists of variables, like in their case, the one morphisms are extra variables plus super potentials and all the variables just in, like in their case. And now for the two morphisms, I take isomorphism classes of matrix factorizations and no three morphisms. So that's what I'm going to use um, as my target category for a, two, for a two dimensional uh, fully extended topological quantum field theory. So as advertised, um, I now want to regard to construct this by constructing a functor from this category so that board 210 means associate something two dimension 012 and map this to this target category, which is a truncated kapustin rosansky category. Um, OK, so then in this, um, what I want to do is to sort of reconstruct the, or construct the topological quantum field theory from the value that the functor takes on the point. And in addition, so yeah, so that, that means that I would like to look at a situation where everything is fully dualizable and use the adjunction data. So then the adjunction data in, on the geometric side, um, where I explained to you that we can sweep out the two-dimensional surfaces by looking at special building blocks, and then that adjunction data has to get mapped to adjunction data in the target category. And then on every, every level, one has to check dualizability conditions. Um, and this functor has to map the junctions to the junctions. 
So let's start. Um, so on the geometric side, I have geometric uh, objects in the lowest layer. So the, you know, I'm in zero dimensions and we have points. Um, on the target side, I map this to list of variables. Okay, so then let's look at adjunctions. So in particular, there is this one morphism that's supposed to be the identity. And uh, so we just have to take this from their paper. So that's this map A times X minus Y. That was the identity surface defect in this other picture. Okay, so now I need this adjunction data. And um, here the dual of this object is again this object. So again, a list of variables and the um, uh, if I have several points, then it just means to um, unify this list of variables on that side. And now for my evaluation, I have to map from one list of variables together with another one to the empty set. So I basically just again take this super potential and regard it as a map from here times here to here. And same for the co-evaluation, I um, take just a different point of view on the same morphism. Okay, so now um, I've specified this and for in order for this to be consistent, this thing must hold. So this is again this a, a variant of the dualizability condition that I showed on one of the first slides. So one has to check that if I compose um, these identity morphisms or these variants of the identity morphisms in this way, uh, that this gives the identity line. And that's, that's of course, uh, something that holds uh, basically because this was the identity defect in the Kapustin-Rosansky theory and they basically already checked this for us. Um, okay, so that's this first layer. And now we need to go to the surfaces. So this is also not super well visible, but I think you can see it. Ah, good that I drew something by hands on the first slide. Um, so these are these uh, saddles that have that connect something two lines at the bottom between uh, together with this um, evaluation um, at the top. So this is a saddle and this is some kind of a bridge and this is uh, a head and a cup. And from these building blocks, I want to glue together all my surfaces. And so what I have to do is to say what matrix factorizations um, these things are. Um, so now in this picture, um, you can not quite see that I associated bulk variables to these edges and then there are um, surface variables associated to these lines. Um, but since I didn't want to really explain how to come, uh, yeah, all this matrix factorization formalism, let me just say that I can associate to such surfaces, so to the saddle and to this bridge, uh, some explicit matrix factorization. So this thing is associated to that, and this thing is associated to that. And this is maybe better visible. So here I have A prime minus A, so A prime and A are associated to these lines, and then there's a bulk variable X. Um, separating the two of them and a y in the back. So there's supposed to be a point in the back here or in this picture, one can maybe see this y and x and a prime and a. And well, the point is that there are explicit matrix factorizations that can associate, that I can associate such that this um, Zorro move again holds. So this is um, the two dimensional duality condition um, it basically looks like the one um, I showed you before. So basically um, there you can imagine that there's a line. So this rotated Z that you can um, imagine in this picture. And then this whole thing is supposed to evaluate to 
one cylindrical piece, which is the identity on this piece on the bottom. Okay, so now I have everything. Um, so there are two of these moves and one has to check a little bit more and so on. But basically these are the building blocks and now we can start uh, computing anything up to two dimensions, so up to this. Um, so the anything is apart from the topological twist, of course, that allows me only to see the twisted sector, but then there's another limitation on the anything that comes from this truncation. So I can compute stuff in dimension two, for example. So I can evaluate the functor on a genus G surface. So how, um, how do I do this? So I um, decompose it into um, this cup and uh, cap building pieces that you saw. And then here's uh, a torus with two boundaries that can also be decomposed into building blocks that I showed on the previous slides. So some saddles and bridges that can be glued together to do this. Then I can use functoriality to evaluate this functor on the pieces and uh, compute. And then the result is that the functor evaluated on a genus G surface is just this space. Um, so let me say, what is it formally? So formally, it's a matrix factorization of zero. So just an ordinary complex that can be by isomorphism um, replaced uh, by its cohomology. So we have to compute some cohomology of some complex. So this gives me this uh, state space and it precisely has uh, the polynomial ring in two, uh, in two n variables here. So that's in particular the state space you want to associate to the sphere. And then as advertised, it has stuff coming from the fermions. So this is basically a fermionic uh, Fox space like you would uh, expect from, from physics. So from this twisting argument that I gave before. And it depends on, so for any, for genus G, you get two, two guys. And then for N hypers, you get factor N here. Okay, so um, this is what I can compute from the building blocks in the, um, using the things I associated uh, on the previous slide. But let me imagine to cut this again. And this time I want to cut this into, pair of pants and on one of the first slides I said that um, in two dimensional TQFTs one can, one can expect um, some Frobenius structure or some products associated to uh, acting on the space that one associates to a circle. So now I want to do this game again. So cut this up and give uh, some more interpretation um, to the pieces. So for, to do this, we first have to look again at the circle. Um, so the circle can be obtained by gluing these two things together. Um, and the functor associates to this, uh, well, a bunch of variables and the super potential. Um, so it's this bunch of variables. So everything um, gets sur becomes surface variables and then we have a super potential here and one can find some isomorphism of this stuff with the z2 graded modules of c of a x so in particular this is maybe something yet that you might um, want to identify with by other uh, so some people can identify this with line operators on uh, C2 um, for other reasons. Um, so in particular here, my truncated two category sees the Grotendieck ring of the category of line operators here. Mm. And okay, so that's what is, what is associated to the circle. And okay, so we cut up the surface into pairs of pants and we can say what the pairs of pants do and we can or we can compute what the pairs of pants do and they just give the tensor product of matrix factorization restricted to the isomorphism classes appearing in this thing. Okay, um, yeah, so now um, one can compute 
anything. Um, so in particular, um, I could, and so, uh, so far I regarded this defect category just as a target category to formulate um, the extended uh, topological quantum field theory, but we can now sort of play games and uh, sort of uh, emphasize the strengths of this approach, so to speak, by saying that we can imagine other, other uh, diagrams that we could compute. So in particular, I can reintroduce defects as uh, defects uh, also in this extended picture. So that means that uh, instead of just looking at the identity defect all the time and associating it to lines, we can put something here and allow for other superpotentials um, that then become lines in this two-dimensional picture. And um, for example, um, if one wants to do some fun computations, one can look at uh, this picture. So that would, in the initial physical picture, correspond to quantizing something not on, not on this torus, but on this torus with some defect extending in the time direction that you have singled out for canonical quantization, or also put it, so this would be would dress any result by some sort of quantum dimension of this defect, while this would be slightly more complicated. Um, yeah, that brings me um, to the end of my talk. Um, I think I presented a very simple example of a fully extended uh, TQFT. So as far as I'm aware, there are not even that many examples around. Uh, so here is one that is uh, particularly simple, um, just a free field theory from, uh, from the physical perspective, but still has some interesting features, I think. Uh, for example, it gives an example of a rosansky witten theory uh, with non-compact target. Um, so in the old paper by Rosansky and Witten from 96, um, they looked at um, three-dimensional uh, sigma models with uh, compact targets in 3D n equals 4. Um, yeah, and the reason was that um, if you have compact targets, then uh, things are more approachable as uh, uh, state spaces become gapped and so on. Um, so in this, if we use this uh, picture that I uh, tried to advertise, um, we are not limited by this so much, and at least not if we only go to this uh, level where I truncated, and it kind of gives also a new method for computations in some sense or in some examples. So straightforward extensions, so of course one would like to look at maybe more interesting examples. Um, straightforward extensions would be to obtain abelian gauge theories, so um, to gauge a U1, so that's something under construction that we are looking at. Um, so that gives maybe slightly more interesting classes of examples um, that are not so much different from what I presented. And then maybe a bit further away one could, uh, so I sort of used the first three pages of the kapustin rosansky paper, but it has in fact more pages. Uh, and on the next uh, several pages, they look at more general geometries of the form T star M, where M is not CN, but something more interesting. And they also work out what the, uh, what the category is in that case. And one could, for example, get some inspiration from these later pages and form, try to formulate the extended TQFT uh, for those categories. Okay, so... Um, happy birthday, Mike, again, and this is the end of my talk. Are there questions for Ilka? I have a question, yeah. Yeah, because you, you, should, you should have the second flavor symmetry, R symmetry for gradings. Does mean that your superpotential also and uh, homogeneous? Yes, yeah, yes. So in this, uh, so in, if I just, uh, 
do this extended TQFT like I did for the main part of this talk, it's important that the super potential was A times X minus Y. So that's uh, nicely homogeneous and has uh, one grading where the A's and the X variables, so the surface variables and the bulk variables have opposite charges. And then there are some uh, different R symmetry grading where they are the same. Yeah, so I have a question, and maybe it's a little uh, imprecise question, but usually uh, one, one takes TQFT with target in a uh, category of like vector spaces, Yes. for example. And uh, there's another thing you can do, and well, people from physics tell me, tells me that happens, that sometimes the theory is not fully defined, it has some kind of anomaly, but then it sits on the boundary of something else, and there's some, uh, <coughs> some contribution from the work that cancels that anomaly. And uh, it, it, it sort of looks similar, at least in terms of drawings, from taking something with target in a defect category. Do you, do you know if there's any good relation between? Um, well, if this works, uh, so in my case, all of these things work. So what I did is sort of to define a consistent TQFT by from these pictures and from these associations. And then it means that there's no anomaly. Um, so if there's an anomaly, it would mean that uh, something doesn't work in this gluing and decomposing uh, business. I, I see. Well, I guess my question is that this uh, rosowski witten theory is a 3D theory. So is uh, somehow behind the scenes what's happening that you have a 2D theory that sits on the boundary of a uh, space time with this uh, um, it doesn't. Uh, so I have a 2D theory that takes values in some different category and um, if you look at if you want to look to, to relate it to boundaries uh, then you would have to look at um, special defects um, so here i looked at the identity defects basically between the theory and itself but you can include stuff that is um, a defect between the nothing theory and the theory so that would be a boundary and then you can play the same game also. So you can include this kind of uh, situation in the fully extended uh, picture. So um, for this, so you could, for these guys, so for these extra lines that I uh, kind of discussed in the semi outlook at the end, uh, you can allow that uh, there are, that this defect connects um, bulk theories with different amount of hypers. So for example, n hypers and zero hypers, and then you have included the boundaries in, in that sense.